All right, welcome back and thanks for staying with us. On Tuesday, the University of Johannesburg's UJ Center for Education Practice Research, CEPR, will host a discussion on children's learning and the learning of caring adults, teachers and parents at the Njabulo Simagate Debele building with the aim of interrogating research into the multiple interventions that can be used to strengthen and advance children's learning. Lydia Plaki is a former colleague here at the SABC, is one of the speakers and she submitted as part of her thesis the study on how SMS technology can be used as an early childhood development tool. We're also joined by the mathematics education and technology expert Professor Nikki Roberts and Kiso, Kizo Marajelo, a PhD candidate at UJ. All three of you, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Lydia, good to see you once again. Yeah. You're going to be a doctor now. How <laughs> awesome. <laughs> what, what, what made you go that way? Okay, so I left the SCBC in 2010 and with the plans that I will now study for the rest of my life. Yeah. Um, so I've completed my master's um, within SMS technology and communications. And um, so I'm doing my doctorate now in SMS as an educational and learning and communication tool within early childhood development. It's such an important conversation with everybody talking about the fourth industrial uh, revolution, how to use technology and incorporate it into education. Let's bring Nikki into the conversation. Nikki, what is the, um, what is the UJ hope to achieve with this conversation on Tuesday? Um, well, I think it's really important to be sharing what our students are doing. Um, and importantly, we try and work in ways that bring together projects that are funded by industry, that have a partnership with government, um, and so that have a real impact on the ground. So all students that I'm working with are working on things that really matter. Um, and I think sharing those lessons is a big part of what we're trying to do on Tuesday. Kito, tell us about your, uh, your PhD, PhD students in early childhood development. What does this all mean? Um, for me, uh, the study focuses on um, early childhood um, education from a non-center-based perspective, especially using play groups. But at the same time, the main focus of the study is on um, early mathematics, and we also using WhatsApp groups and all that, but the study will be conducted in KZN. Quite important to incorporate mathematics early on in a child's learning life because it's one of the things we, we, we're lagging behind in terms of global comparisons, aren't we, uh, Nikki? Yes, yes, no, it is. I think we now know that the problems that we see um, at matric stem from really early on. So we do focus on right from in Kitso's study, which four, five-year-olds, going all the way back to Lydia's study, which is looking at um, 18 to 24 months, um, those very young children in that key thousand days period. Um, so it is really something from conception to matric that yeah. we need to be looking at, and our work tries to focus um, as early as possible. Lydia, you're, you're a parent yourself to oh, beautiful daughters. What does did this process teach you? Uh, more than just what you can take out there. In your own personal space, what did it teach you about how you can incorporate it into how you communicate with your kids? Um, I think one of, one of the learnings within my study was how com important it is to talk to your child. Um, so my study is very much about, and also something that I believe in within my own household, um, parent is the first teacher, Home is the first classroom, and that's where education starts. Yeah. And it's very much focused on that. But I think the other important thing also about my study was that we do not have a national parenting program within South Africa. We also do... Parents are on autopilot. Yes. Yeah. And then as part of government service delivery program, is not communicating with its citizens. And what my study is focusing on and um, also the results is saying it's important for government to speak to its citizens. In the same way that they deliver water, electricity, yeah. they need to communicate with our citizens, but specifically with parents, yeah. families, with young children. 
and help them within this first phases of the child's development on what it is that they can do within their homes. One would think that the SMS is actually one of the most overused aspects of technology in terms of uh, what we use to communicate in, with our smartphones. How do you use your, in your research, what were your findings in terms of how we can take it further and use it for educational development? So one of the things is that we have more cell phones in South Africa than citizens. And most of the phones that we have in South Africa are not smartphones. Are actually a phone where people can receive an SMS on, send a please call me or make a call. And the majority of our mothers within South Africa survive on their childcare grant. And they buy airtime for about five rand per month. They don't buy data. And the only way oh, that wow. they can communicate with the outside world or get messages is via an SMS. So that is the space where you can get them. Marketing companies currently use it to get into those spaces where they send people messages about insurance, this special, or that. Yeah. But, I mean, this is the point where government can communicate to its citizens. Send that SMS. So what we've done within the study was that um, there's a curriculum. Okay. And it's available. And um, the mothers received three messages per week for over a period of six months. Is yeah. this in conjunction with the Department of Education? Um, no. This was um, a partnership between a technology company, a funder, and um, a consultancy. Okay. And I was responsible for developing the curriculum. 160 characters yeah. per message. And then on a Monday, we send the mother a message that will motivate her as a mother. On <coughs> Tuesday, um, information about her child, the child's development, brain development, yeah. and that Friday message will build on the Wednesday message and then we'll give her an activity that she can do with the child over the weekend. How effective can it be if it's not incorporated into mainstream education? If it's not incorporated? Yeah. Um, I think... Because the, the way you're describing it now, it's only being done on a, uh, in private. Um, so this was a pilot, we tested okay. it, and okay. my studies at the stage were the findings saying to the South African government, here's okay. something that you can implement. Okay. And learning to be a mother is never formal, it's just something that you're expected to do. I um, agree though, we do need to have a formal conversation about it. Yeah, so there mm -hmm. is a, a government prerogative to give some support to parents. Yes. Um, because it's not as if you're just born able to know what to do with your child. Um, so from the Department of Health, the Department of Social Development, the Department of Education, there are key things that mothers can access which can help them in that process. But most importantly, from my taking from Lydia's study, is the importance of talking in your home language, not using baby talk, talking directly, looking for things to stimulate your child. Um, it's been a fantastic piece of work. So. It's such a multifaceted conversation yeah. though. How do you hope to uh, complete it in a day's session? Well, this is one of three, right? Lydia has presented twice before. She's definitely not finished. A yeah. PhD is not the culmination of what you're doing. It's yeah. really the beginning of a career and she has a lot more work to do to shake up the world. Kito, the work that you all are doing is so academic. It's uh, based in an office, in a hall somewhere where you interact with people. How do we get it to the people on the ground? Um, I think uh, with the work that I'm doing currently uh, in an NGO, uh, we, we, we... What NGO is this? It's an ECD NGO uh, with an outreach uh, program that focuses entirely on those rural communities where we don't have uh, crashes, yeah. if I have to, yeah. to put it that way. So the program... Uh, uh, bridges that gap where kids are not accessing ECD services so they go and run play groups and home visits but with a focus on ECD education. When there is such amazing work being done Nikki why are we not seeing the impacts? For argument's sake you currently are conducting research on the different aspects of primary teacher education in the Eastern Cape 
This is one province where uh, yeah. continuously has, has remained a poor performer uh, when it comes to academic uh, uh, performance. Yeah. Well, w what have been your findings there and, and how do we show that the, the work that you're doing mm -hmm. is impacting society? Well, I do think we you have a role in the media to get the message out, which is part of why we're holding the seminar and wanting to be with you today. Yeah. Um, because I think there is a misconception that we're not making any progress. Okay. Um, the Eastern Cape one was a really interesting project. Again, it involves the government, it involves funders, it involves technology partners, and then academics to be looking at how to do this. Um, and it was working with um, grade R teachers. We know from our diagnostic reports that the quality of grade R is poor. There's a lot of investment happening from various provinces to make sure that our grade R um, spaces are both safe as well as stimulating to our young children. The thing is that education takes time, and I know you talk about week by week. Um, I talk about education changing in decades, um, and we are on an yeah. upward trajectory in relation to is even, that mathema the case? even mathematics. I'll certainly send you some of my articles oh, that wow. give you the evidence on that. But so it's difficult to say we are improving. It was from a low base, yeah. but we're certainly on an upward trajectory. How? how what does it mean, though, when, when we're on an upward trajectory? Um, does it mean that we can start to forecast for the next 12 years or so and say this is where we can see ourselves? Absolutely. Based on where I, we are I now? think, I mean, it's a national imperative that we have maths and science and, and STEM subjects, particularly yeah. for our young women. Um, we're seeing more and more access to that. We're seeing that our township schools are producing the same number. Um, of maths graduates as we had, of, of matric graduates as yeah. we have in fee-paying schools. So our issues around equity are starting very slowly to equalize, and I think that's a key part of the way in which we see our country moving forward, that Do we have everyone having access and achieving in these kind of tough subjects. Just in terms of research, how are all these STEM subjects uh, faring in terms of, some people will tell you that technology is starting to surpass mathematics. Is, is that mm. the case? Is, is that how we're going? Well, I think there are ways in which you can be in the technology industry without having mathematics. There's a whole range of kind of ICT requirements that are needed that bring together um, mm. entrepreneurship, the, a, a sense of um, who the... Who the um, customers are and being able to develop yeah. um, software apps that type of thing and we're seeing young children being able to do that um, so I think the need for pure mathematics going straight into a degree for engineering is still necessary, still necessary. but you still have a number of youth who are able to access the ICT space um, and I think even just being digital users is a key part of joining a global world you don't know that there's a climate change protest unless you have access to some data and that's where I think a government intervention to make sure that our e-education policy is really realized and so that mothers like the ones Lydia has been worked, working with have SMS um, delivered freely and that they are able to reply. So that's all part of zero rating data for education purposes, um, which is a key part of what we need to be able to unlock this yeah. fourth industrial revolution. And it's really at the very simple level for us here, I think, using SMS to communicate um, is not what we think when we think robotics and coding. Yeah, right, yeah. It's a little WhatsApp group that connects people who are giving And ECD. as Lydia says, it's readily available. Absolutely. Yeah. A WhatsApp group to connect the little groups that are meeting under trees in KZN, that's part of a technology revolution. Mm, and it's yeah. not complicated, it's, but it's, it's pivotal. But now the biggest gripe about education and curriculum has been that it's usually not up to speed with living realities. How are we, how are we navigating mm. that space in terms of bring, harmonizing these two? Yeah, so I, th I think one of the things that we've managed to do um, in South Africa is stabilize the curriculum. You know, we had a lot of curriculum change early on, which was necessary, um, but it was overwhelming. So as I say, you've got to look at the decades, not the years. So yeah. yes, gaming and coding and all of those things are important. Um, the government has just introduced a, a range of um, vocationally focused subjects into schools and we have to be investing in and strengthening our colleges and TVET system. Right? So the education system needs to adapt to the change but fundamentally you're going to need to do reading, writing and arithmetic. Um, it's not going to change that much. You still need people who can think yeah. and if you start to see education as a path into I know how to learn um, yeah. then you're setting people up to learn whatever they need to.
So this conversation on Tuesday wants to achieve two things. On the one hand, new interventions in terms of teaching learners, but also interventions in terms of the people who are teaching the learners. Absolutely. Yes. It's and a broad, big conversation. Broadening, broadening who that is. Yeah. So one of the key things it is doesn't we necessarily often only have to be the teacher. Formal school and teachers. Lydia's study is, but the mothers are the first teacher. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kitsos study is, but these women who are not formal ECD teachers, they're yeah. called practitioners, they don't have a classroom, they have a tree. Those are our caregivers that we need to be reaching, and we can use technology for that. Okay, thank you so much for your time. We're going to have to end it there, unfortunately. Thanks. Kito okay. Marajalo, PhD student, and Lydia Plug is also uh, studying towards her uh, doctoral studies, and uh, Professor Nikki, um, okay. Nikki, why have, Nikki Roberts. Roberts. Thank you so much for your time. Sure. Well, if you're thank keen you. to participate, uh, the UJ Center for Education Practice will host that conversation next Tuesday at 10 a.m. at the Varsity's SWC Library in the Njabulo Simagahle Debele Building. I uh, hope uh, people will show an interest. Thank you so much for coming through. Thank, thank you for hosting us. Okay. Thank you. I think we're going to take a break.